Hi, my name is David Cunning. I'm a professor in the philosophy department at the University of Iowa. And today I'll be introducing the philosophical views of Margaret Cavendish. First, a little bit of a biography. Margaret Cavendish was born Margaret Lucas in 1623. The Lucas family had tight connections to the uh, crown, to the monarchy, uh, and uh, King Charles I and Queen Henrietta Maria. Those connections actually got the family into some uh, trouble. Uh, Margaret Lucas was born in Essex, England at St. John's Abbey. That was the residence. And uh, this is the only uh, part of that residence that still stands uh, in the early 1640s as uh, part of the English Civil War followers and supporters of Oliver Cromwell uh, ransacked uh, the, the home of uh, the Lucas family. And this is all that uh, remains standing. Margaret Lucas was uh, appointed to the court of uh, Queen Henrietta Maria uh, in her early 20s, and uh, she uh, quickly went into exile with the Queen. This was all around the time of the start of the English Civil War, first to Oxford, which of course isn't too far away from where they were, uh, but then to Paris. And Margaret Lucas would remain in exile for almost 20 years until 1660 with the uh, return of Charles II to the crown in England and Margaret Cavendish would uh, reside in England uh, until her death in 1673. Uh, in, 16, in, uh, in Paris, uh, Margaret Cavendish, Margaret Lucas married, uh, met and married William Cavendish. And uh, she would report that he was a supportive uh, husband in terms of her intellectual and other pursuits and such. Uh, here are a couple of images which are always fun. A uh, Bolsover Castle, uh, which is in England where uh, Margaret Cavendish and William Cavendish resided after their return and also Welbeck Abbey. This is an image, a uh, cover of one of the uh, books that Cavendish wrote. She wrote five or six philosophical monographs, depending on how you count. She also wrote a large number of plays, poems, uh, pieces of fiction. Uh, she was quite, uh, quite prolific as an author. Uh, she has a whole lot, whole lot of views. I thought we'd just look at a few of them. Uh, one of her uh, central views is that minds are material. Uh, and she would say really all of creation, all of the created universe is material. Uh, minds are material things and of course bodies are material. She thinks that's really all there is. Uh, one of her arguments for the view that minds are material is that uh, there's no such thing as immaterial motion. Immaterial motion is impossible. Uh, the only kinds of things that move are bodies, right? Which seems kind of intuitive at least to me. Uh, and then she's thinking, well, when, when we uh, are thinking and we're you know, walking downtown in London or something, uh, we're, we're, we're thinking or we're walking, then uh, our, our thought is traveling along with us. Right? We're thinking in one place, we're thinking in another place. Uh, she's thinking, well, clearly that our minds must be material uh, in, in that case. Another argument that she offers for the view that minds are material is that our minds clearly interact with our bodies. And if so, it must be that our minds and bodies are made of the same kind of stuff, right? Minds, if they're able to interact or budge our bodies, it must be that they're material also. Uh, in a way, this is a kind of response to philosophers like Descartes. Descartes thought that minds are immaterial, but somehow they're still connected to our bodies, united to our bodies and interact with them. But Descartes couldn't really explain how. Cavendish is thinking that's a real gap and, and she's got a, a better account. Uh, Cavendish then is going to uh, sort of leverage uh, that view, right, that, that minds are material, into an argument uh, for the view that thinking and perception are pervasive in the natural world. Their thinking and perception are ubiquitous. The idea here is, well, she, she thinks she's already got reason to believe that our brains think, right, that the matter in our brains thinks. Uh, but then she wants to say, there's no way that our brains could think if our brains were made of bodies that at the most basic level only had features like size, shape, and motion. Because if they only, if our brains only had, if our brains were made of bodies that only had features like size, shape, and motion, then they could combine together into larger bodies that also had features like size, shape, and motion. But it'd be magic if all of a sudden thinking arose from that, right? Um, so she's thinking, well, because our brains do think, it must be that at the most basic level, uh, bodies admit of some kind of trace of thinking and perception. And then she's going to say, well, that's a reason to think then that there's thinking across the board in the natural world, because uh, the same kinds of bodies that compose our brains, uh, the basic kinds of elements are going to be the bodies that are out there in the natural world in trees and in plants and in, in insects and cells. And, and so there's a kind of thinking and perception that, that's across the board. 
Uh, so she's going to say animals clearly think. She thinks it's obvious just from observing the behavior of animals, like how crocodiles adjust their nest or something when a, when a storm is coming, and then what birds, uh, how birds behave. Uh, but then she also has this other argument that says, well, we would just be able to predict that those creatures would have some kind of thought and perception since they're made of bodies that at the most basic level have features like thought and perception. And she would say insects, ants, bees. In her poems, she's got these wonderful uh, uh, pieces like an ode to an ant, an ode to the bees, uh, where she really uh, respects them, ode to the spider, <laughs> basically. Um, that they, they, they think and they're, they're, they're wise, even if they don't have the same kind of intelligence, she would say that. Uh, human beings do when they think with, with a high level of conscious reflection. Uh, Cavendish also uh, posits embodied intelligence, thinks she's one of the earliest figures to do this. Uh, it's a familiar kind of term nowadays. Uh, we talk about ways in which our body might do something skillfully. Uh, uh, scientists talk about how cancer cells are smart in some contexts. Uh, Cavendish is thinking that when we uh, uh, walk down the street, our feet are moving skillfully, but we're not thinking about it. Maybe a piano player has fingers that are moving skillfully, but if you think about the motions, that's when you mess up a note. Uh, she's thinking that uh, there's all kinds of intelligent, skillful activity that, that isn't uh, highly conscious. Okay. Uh, another important tenet of the Cavendish system is that uh, there's never a transfer of motion between one body and another body. Uh, this is a maybe a counterintuitive uh, idea because it, it, off, it sure looks like uh, one body will sometimes hit a second body and the second body will have some new motion as a result because it moves differently than it was moving before. But Kevin is just thinking, no way, right? That can't be the story, right? Um, motion is a, is a feature of the body that has it. And she would say it's impossible for motion ever to sort of detach from a body and kind of free float from one body to another and enter that second body. Right? That's it, sort of incoherent. Motion is inseparable from the body that has it. And so she would say that uh, the right account when one body hits a second body is that the first body maybe occasions motion in the second body, but the second body moves by means of motions that it had in it already. Maybe we don't notice these motions, but they're in there you know, circling around. They just get redirected uh, by, the, by the first body. Uh, so that's a really important tenet of her system. She's disagreeing with a lot of the, the figures at the time. Um, that view is going to inform her view of sense perception as well. Cavendish's view is that when we have a sense perception, the, uh, there, there's something called uh, patterning that goes on in our sense organs. Here she's opposing philosophers like Hobbes, uh, who was a contemporary. Hobbes would say that when an external body um, interacts with our sense organ and we have a sense perception of the external body, the external body presses itself on our sense organ imposes motion on our sense organ, stamps itself on our sense organ. Hobbes uses language like that. Cavendish would say, no way, right? We know that motion is never transferred from one body to the other. So when, uh, when a sense organ forms an image of an external body, it must be that the motions right, by which that image is formed in the sense organ are motions that the sense organ had in it already, right? And the sense organ is active and it produces an image of an external body. Clearly, the external body occasions uh, those motions, but the motions are already in the sense organ. Uh, it's going to be an important aspect of her, of her thinking, where she disagrees with folks like Hobbes and then later figures like Hume. Right. Another important aspect of Cavendish's system, and this is the last slide, is that nature is a plenum, right? The physical the material universe, all of its uh, thoughts uh, and all the bodies in it, all material, and it's full. There's no empty space. Uh, She's thinking uh, as a result of that, that uh, all the bodies in nature uh, depend on each other, right? Bodies are always surrounded by other bodies that are moving and doing all kinds of stuff and interacting with each other. So she says, uh, none of the parts of nature subsist singly and by itself. So she has a bunch of passages where she applies this view. She says things like, uh, in the case of seeds, right? A, seeds dep a seed depends uh, on the creatures that surround it uh, for, for what it's gonna become. So if a seed is just sitting there, it's not going to turn into a tree. Uh, it's got to get uh, some help from light and air and soil and such, and then it becomes a tree or a plant or whatever it's going to become. Uh, Cavendish would say things like, no creature is an island. And she'd even joke, you know, no island is an island, right? Not even an island is an island, because an island, if you remove the water, uh, it's just a big hill right at the bottom of the ocean, and it's all all connected, uh, a big hill that uh, starts at the bottom of the ocean. 
uh, she's going to then extend this view right, and say, uh, it's not just the commonsensically physical features of bodies that, uh, that depend on that, the behavior of the things that surround them. She would say also the social and political features of a creature depend uh, on the behavior of the creatures that surround them. Uh, here she talks a lot in the context of gender. Right? She's thinking that if somebody is going to be a philosopheress or a generaless, in order for them to actually be one of those things, like a military general, uh, it's going to need to be the case that the, the people in that general less's environment are willing to take seriously the authority of a woman as a general. And if they don't listen to her orders or see her as authoritative, she's not going to be a general. She's not going to be put in the position of having the authority of a general. And so uh, whether or not she is a general depends not just on the things that are going on uh, on her end, right, but, but on the features of the creatures that are in her environment and how they uh, perceive her. Uh, so what she does here, this is really interesting, in her fiction, she writes a bunch of plays and, and, uh, and fictional stories where she basically transports creatures to alternate worlds, to other worlds. And in these alternate worlds, the creatures are in different environments, environments that are more uh, supportive. So a lot of these, again, have to do with gender, where a woman gets transported from Earth to another planet. And on that planet, the the creatures in the environment are more receptive to the idea of a woman as a philosopher or a scientist or a military general. And that means that a woman can be those things. And it doesn't mean on Cavendish's view that women need supports or props that men don't. Her thought is that on the real world earth, men are already propped up in all kinds of ways that women are not. And so in creating these alternate worlds, she's probably doing a few things. She's uh, maybe there's a little bit of escapism going on uh, but she's also trying to uh, create alternate worlds that show by contrast what supports are available to some on earth and, and that are not available to some on earth. Uh, she's also probably trying to paint a picture right, of how things could be very different so that people could uh, to, to achieve certain goals and identities that are blocked from them on earth. It might be surprising to think that Cavendish would be uh, so progressive given that she's uh, a monarchist and a fairly conservative in her politics. Uh, but uh, there, there's some really interesting work being done, for example, by Brandy Siegfried at BYU that highlights that, that Cavendish was a kind of uh, uh, a monarchist who, or who, was, uh, who was fairly progressive. Thank you very much for your time. If you have any questions at all, I would like some further correspondence at, at david-cunning at uiowa.edu. Thanks so very much for your time.